Hi everyone, Karina Barn here, Executive Director with Symphony Tacoma. Thank you so much for joining us for our first music mixer of the season as we get ready to welcome everyone into the Pantages Theater next Saturday, October 23rd at 7.30 p.m. for our first show back uh, during the pandemic. We are so thrilled uh, to be doing live performances again and we cannot wait to see you in our hall. I did want to acknowledge uh, that we are on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe. Uh, the Puyallup people have lived on and stewarded these lands since the beginning of time and continue to do so today. We recognize that this land acknowledgement is just one very small step that Symphony Tacoma is doing towards true allyship, and we commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, and histories of the indigenous people of this land and beyond. Our performance this weekend is made possible thanks to very generous sponsors. So I wanted to take a moment and thank our uh, season sponsor, Multicare, as well as our concert sponsors, Eliseo, Gordon Thomas Honeywell, University of Puget Sound, Marlene's Market in Delhi, Tacoma Creates an Art Month. Now, I'm so, so excited to pass the baton over to our wonderful host of this evening, Greg Utes, as well as our maestra, Sarah Ioannidis, uh, who are going to talk to you more about this program and let you know why you should be joining us next week. Well, thank you very much, Karina, and welcome, everybody. Hi, Sarah. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you, too. <laughs> oh, we are, we are just so looking forward to being back to live music. Um, in the Pantages. And Sarah, I wondered if you might just uh, tell us a little bit about how you thought about this season. Uh, what, how, how do you design a season that somehow acknowledges where we've been and looks forward to where we hope we're going? Right, absolutely. Well, you know, having been away from the orchestra for what seems like an age, 18 months, it was really important that uh, we come back together with really beloved works uh, that, that we can you know, cherish together, as well as break into new and diverse ground and cover some of the composers that really had should have been on the slate the last 75 years, had it been a different world. So there's that, and then there's a lot of rescheduling of some of our very talented artists and composers um, that, that we, we scheduled, including a work by yours, which, which we have to wait a little bit longer because of certain circumstances around vocal singing still being slower to come back. Um, but the most important thing I think it's really is about our 75th anniversary. And so looking towards the future and looking back. So I couldn't help but want to open the season with one of our favorite soloists of all time since I've been music director, and that's Charlie Albright. Let's welcome Charlie to the mixer. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. How are you? Hi, Charlie. It's great to see you. It's great to see you, too. Do we understand you're at home these days now? A lot of at home, lots of online stuff, things like that, like uh, I guess is across the board for pretty much everyone nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, Charlie and Sarah, I know you've known each other and worked together in the past. Um, Charlie, go ahead and, and give us just the, the, the elevator speech bio. Just, I'm sure a lot of people know that you're a local kid, but uh, just to make sure everyone does, tell us a little bit about where you came from and, and how you got to where you are now. Uh, sure. Um, I, I was born and raised down in Centralia, Centralia, Washington. Uh, so not too far away, just down I-5. And I, I lived there until I was... Uh, uh, off time to go to college. My parents are still down there. Um, I moved to uh, uh, the East Coast. I lived in Boston for a few years. Uh, I went to uh, college and did my master's there and then moved down to New York. Um, so I did some studying there and lived there for a few years before moving back out to the Northwest. So I'm in the, in the, in the Seattle area. Uh, it's just really nice to be home. I, you know, Northwest. Yay. And um, I've been, you know, just basically touring and, and performing um, all over the place up until, of course, uh, you know, COVID basically shut everything down. And so it's been a lot of, you know, doing things remotely now. Uh, but this season is looking like, you know, things are, are quite busy. So I'm going to start doing a lot of traveling and stuff. And it's, it's, I'm excited that this is the first concert uh, kind of back on the road. So um, it's great, great to, to start it off here. Great. And uh, Charlie, you very modestly passed over uh, uh, the fact that you were in Boston at both Harvard and, and uh, 
the New England Conservatory simultaneously getting degrees in economics and piano, and then we're off in Juilliard. Uh, so <laughs> your, your pedigree is spectacular, as of course is your performing. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, audiences love about you, and particularly our own homegrown audiences here, is your um, habit of improvising. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us just a little bit about that quite unusual skill that not, not that, I mean, you know, Mozart and Beethoven, yes, that was part of their training. They knew how to do that. But, but you've kind of taken up that, that improvisation challenge again in the 21st century. Tell us just a little bit about how you do that. Sure. Well, I, when I was starting piano, I started when I was about three and a half. And until I was seven or eight, I didn't know how to read music at all. So I was taught entirely by ear. And um, I went, I had several teachers that kind of taught me um, things completely by ear. So I played everything from Backstreet Boys to Great Balls of Fire and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I did a lot of improvising along with it, because even if you're playing um, a melody that, you know, is, is common, you're still making up, you know, the cover and making it sound good on the piano. And I also liked making up my own stuff. And uh, when I was about seven or eight, I, I started taking from Nancy Adsit in Olympia and she introduced me to classical music and reading. Um, but the improvisation stuff was always things that I always continued to like to, to perform and improvise, but I didn't really do much of it in concert. Um, and so, but, but it was definitely something that I kept doing on my own. And in college, when I started performing and touring more and more, I, uh, uh, I started kind of incorporating that into, into concerts. So oftentimes if I give a recital, I'll, um, I'll take a, uh, some notes from the audience and improvise a short piece or something. And um, it's kind of expanded. Sometimes I'll do an entirely improvised concert or sometimes I'll improvise a cadenza and a concerto. But it's something that it's a lot of fun and it seems like it's, uh, audiences like it too. So it's a win-win. <laughs> I love it because it really does draw together the, the continuum, which is performing and composing, you know, and, 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 and most of the great music that we love came out of people who were involved in both of those. And so I just love the fact that you're bringing that back to life for us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Sarah and Charlie, go ahead and tell us, um, how did you decide to do the Shostakovich second piano concerto on this concert? Let me toss it first to Sarah. Well, uh, you know, Charlie has a huge repertoire list, so that's a great advantage for us to be able to pick. And he sent many, many suggestions along to me. Um, but this was already when I was thinking about uh, Tchaikovsky's Patetique Symphony and looking for something that would be light and um, refreshing and upbeat and about the right length. And, um, you know, we were scheduled to do the Boulanger fantasy for piano and orchestra, and hopefully we'll still do that, but it is a larger instrumentation. So we had to change the repertoire to not only fit the opening um, symphony uh, on this program, but also to, to fit the repertoire instrumentation that we have planned. And so Charlie had a lot of great choices, but when he said, you know, I love this piece, I, I've taught it, you know, Shostakovich and Tchaikovsky, certainly they cover the gamut of Russian history for most of the 19th and then, the, you know, the majority of the 20th century, too. So it, it really gives a great uh, Russian opening and um, a way to, to look in and, and um, into the world of two of the Russia's greatest composers. Uh, Charlie, this piece is a later piece in Shostakovich's oeuvre. It's, what, 1957 or something. So we're, Stalin is gone. We're talking about Khrushchev, a certain amount of opening up at the time. And I know there were other circumstances, including um, his son, Maxim's graduation from conservatory. Tell us a little bit about the story of, of this concerto. So this was actually, it was written for, on, on behalf of his son as kind of a, a gift. And so when you listen to the piece, it's, it's a lot of it is, I, I kind of joke around and this is somewhat true, but like if you learn one hand of the piece, you basically know the other hand because 90% of the time, the hands are playing exactly the same notes. It's almost like um, it's, a, it's a, a, a hand in exercise in some parts, particularly in the third movement where you're basically just doing these little, you know, exercise scales up and down the keyboard. Um, the first movement starts off with this very kind of, you know, almost righteous, pompous kind of a, a, a grandiose entrance. And it, you know, it has reminiscences of other Russian composers. Uh, and then the second movement comes along. And if you wouldn't know better, you might think that it was Chopin. It's so schmaltzy, sh so romantic. So just, 
lyrically beautiful um, with with these, you know, these very, very pure chords, which is, you know, uh, which is very different than a lot from what we hear from like Rachmaninoff, for example, where you have these very complicated, you know, uh, harmonies. And uh, so, so the piece is it's uh, it's really one of my favorite concertos because it has all of this and it's just it's just a blast to play. I fell in love with this piece because of that second movement. Oh, yeah. um, it's just the most beautiful nugget. I think I heard it when I was about 16, 17 years ago old. Um, my music teacher introduced, he would have little soirees in his living room, invite all of the music students over and just play us pieces and introduce us to great pieces. And he played this movement and, you know, we were just all kind of captivated because it's such a delicate and beautiful thing and it, it really almost doesn't sound like Shostakovich can, can you play oh, absolutely oh, yeah. let me show you a little bit it, it, it almost reminds me of a let me take you to the piano it almost reminds me a little bit of a uh, uh, of a movie soundtrack like it could fit in perfectly well with like you know the notebook mm -hmm. or, or something along those lines yeah. um okay let me turn off my echo calculation and uh let me let me give you a try here this is the uh, beginning of the second movement sans uh sans orchestra of course but imagine the the rich string tones underneath <laughs> Really, really quite a uh, uh, a beautiful, beautiful lyrical piece. <laughs> yeah, so gorgeous. Um, I don't know if, if you have the capability to play us just a little bit of perhaps the um, uh, perhaps the opening uh, of your uh, section in the in the first movement, and let's hear this remarkable contrast. Absolutely. This will probably sound a lot more like the Shostakovich that a lot of people know. Absolutely. Fantastic. I, I, I fell in love with Shostakovich um, when I was very young, too. Discovered, I think it was the seventh symphony in my parents' record collection and just was overwhelmed by, by the, the variety of music and, and just the power and the drama. Uh, but also, as in the second movement of this one, just the incredible sweetness that he can pull out. <laughs> Absolutely.
Wow. Okay. Well, uh, Charlie, we thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we're really going to look forward to hearing this live in the Pantages. I can't wait. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Charlie. We'll see you soon. You. Yep. Wow. <laughs> Just so fun to watch him play. Uh, so much... I mean, he's so inside the world of the sound that he's creating, and, and it's just a full body experience for obviously him, but even us, which is why he's one of our favorite soloists. <laughs> and as he said, with the orchestra, it sounds quite different, but, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. can't wait to do that. Yeah. With, 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 he's such a, a great artist to accompany because he's, as you see the way he communicates, he's, he's always looking back and listening to the orchestra and, and it's really like having a dialogue with it with a soloist as opposed to you know then burying themselves and and this is you know a light enough piece that you can just do that you know you can uh, you don't have to come like Rachmaninoff you every notice you have to bury yourself to <laughs> find the notes so right. this will be fun yeah great okay well let's talk a little bit then about the the big piece after intermission <clears throat> which is tchaikovsky's sixth and final symphony um which gained the title pathetique um which uh <clears throat> you know um obviously has nothing to do with pathetic it has to do with um uh, emotional pathos drama um and and though Let's just talk a little bit about uh, this symphony in 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 the context of Tchaikovsky's other symphonies. Um, how do you want to begin talking about this this icon of nineteenth century romanticism? Well, I think uh, we we all know Tchaikovsky quite quite a lot as a composer, but just just some reminders. You know, this is his last symphony. I I don't believe it would have been had he not been poisoned with bad water, and that's you know there are, there are a lot of um dialogues about you know whether this piece itself was a su suicide letter or something of that sort and it was whether it was wrapped and shrouded in in the fact that you know he was a homosexual and perhaps in love with his nephew so it's got really really messed up and complicated but but the way tchaikovsky sort of sets us up for this and we have a lot of letters and a lot of dialogue about this piece is he he really felt this this was he needed something especially after writing so many successful ballets and operas he needed something that was purely artistic that was going to be the pinnacle of his great artistic output you know the middle of middle period and so he really was excited about this 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 piece and he poured his soul into it um he even wrote a program note and, and what we we don't know is the enigma that's behind this piece because he always wanted it to remain a secret so we don't know really what the symphony is about other than the little note that he wrote about it and of course the piece is slightly different to than than the way that he initially described it so he there's just a few sentences that he wrote that i'm going to tell you he said this symphony is about the ultimate essence. The symphony is life. So the first part, all impulse, passion, confidence, and thirst for activity must be short. The finale, death, result of collapse. So it's about this, you know, great pouring of a massive amount of energy into the piece and how it, through what happens in the second and third part, drains away. Uh, so the second part, which I assume means the second movement, um, is about love. The third movement about disappointment and fourth ends dying away. Also short, he writes. So that, that's kind of, in essence, what he wrote about the symphony. It's, it's, it's a symphony about life, but we don't know a lot of the details. We know that it was dedicated to his nephew, um, Bob Davidoff, and that he wanted it to remain an, a mystery the the piece just breaks a lot of uh, rules I mean, he was set up for expectation with with symphonies by the german composers and he continued to bend those kind of rules and expectations so for example this symphony the third movement is the loud what you would consider usually the fourth movement the loud the march the ending it, it often people clap after the third movement but then this fourth movement about dying um comes into play 
and uh, it, it's it's the adagio lamentoso, and it, it it's a very very sad ending, and it's because he wrote this in this way. It's almost like um, autobiographical without knowing it in some ways because he died nine days after writing this, and that is just the incredible tra travesty. And he was at his pinnacle, and then to die after writing this unbelievable work and conducting it. He, he didn't even seem to care that the audience actually was not that taken about, about it. I mean, he was, he said, um, what did he say? Um, I'm trying to remember, he, basically, the, here we go. Something strange is happening with this symphony. It's not that it displeased, but it has caused some bewilderment. <laughs> Nevertheless, he continued to believe it was his greatest work. <laughs> well, when you think about it, you know, ever since Beethoven, or even going back to Mozart and Haydn, there were not, not that many symphonies written in the minor, first of all. And, and those that were written in the minor almost invariably ended up somehow in the major. The whole point being that that you transcend the gloom, right? And and Beethoven, of course, makes kind of a career of this, and and it's almost an act of will to end up mm -hmm. triumphantly at the at the end. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for Tchaikovsky to go out of his way to, as you say, almost reverse the third and fourth movements and leave us with this just dying away. I mean, that's a that's a very bold thing to do. It it just the culture would have said that just isn't done. <laughs> and, right. and yet his artistic sense was that in this symphony, that's what needed to happen. It's also interesting that the, the, the beginning of the symphony begins in a whisper. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most terrifying bassoon solos in the, in the repertoire, uh, uh, this quiet little thing. And one can imagine that that is of course an introduction, but, but then what it leads to is, is equally kind of, almost almost restless you know and it's almost searching for for something to stable uh, to stand on and, and doesn't really find it <laughs> yeah. how do you how do you think about i mean this is such a dramatic symphony how do you build the arcs of energy and tension and release in such a work well i feel that tchaikovsky is one of those composers who is so clear about what he wants. He he is quite specific about where to push and where to pull and where to pull back and and the dynamics. I mean, he he was never as detailed as he was with dynamics. He uses mezzo piano, for example, a lot. His previous symphonies don't, and so he he became more and more fussy in particular about what he wants. So I feel like uh, always with Tchaikovsky, there's this amazing sense of structure and melody that unfolds in a very natural way. I mean, it's not always expected how it unfolds. I mean, for example, that even the second movement where, where you have a waltz in five, four, <laughs> it's, you know, definitely not. If, if the ballet tried to dance to that, you know, they, they would, they probably would not play the piece, you know, because in those days, it, you know, they wanted it regular, but uh, it, it's not predictable, but it, it's so obvious where it's where it's going. What he has to say is so clear and crystal. It leads itself, I, I, I find. And so for us, because there are so many things going on at once sometimes, you know, you've got, you know, scales descending up, scales descending down. They're not all at the same time. They're overlapping. There's phrases here and there and everywhere. Um, the most hard thing to do about the symphony is is to synchronize everything and unfold on the same wavelength <laughs> yeah. so that that that's going to be you know it's, it's a tremendous work i i actually i'm doing this for the first time ah wonderful <laughs> and like beethoven 9 i've i've chosen in my career to save the iconic pieces the masterpieces for when I really felt I had a sense of experience with a number of their previous works. Like I, I only conducted Beethoven nine after I'd conducted actually Beethoven 10 and all of the others. So, you know, for, for me, this is also a, a rather um, exciting 
um, journey to take with the orchestra, especially after us not being together for so long. Right. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, let, let's leave the audience with just a little game that they can play during the second movement. You mentioned the uh, the waltz in five four time, and it's 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 even more fun than than that. The audience can. Uh, count along, you go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And you can count that way. So it's in five, four, alternating three plus two and two plus three. Amazingly complicated rhythm. And yet it just sounds absolutely effortless. If I hadn't just told you that, you would probably just think, oh, it's such a pretty tune. But it's a pretty tune with a with a kind of a a curiosity to it that, that is so typical of this whole symphony. There are things about this symphony that just, they, they, at the, on the surface, they sound one way, but underneath there are secrets. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. uh, and we did not share those secrets with us. We are to infer them ourselves. I think we know quite a bit about Tchaikovsky's character because he wrote so many letters. I mean, I, mean, I think there were over a thousand letters to his greatest sponsor, Madame von Meck. And, we know from it that he is a very sensitive person uh, and I, I feel when he gets to the sixth symphony he's lost some of his um self-consciousness he knows who he is he knows how he feels and he becomes bolder and much more true to himself about expressing it and in a way that that movement the five four is to me is expressing the awkwardness and, and the quirkiness, the, the weirdness that he felt about many, many things. And um, gosh, it's beautiful, but at the same time, it's a little bit awkward and uh, uncomfortable, um, yet it plays itself so, so naturally. Um, and there's, there's lots of little things like that. I mean, when you, when you listen to the, the march, you know, it sounds brilliant. And this is really the connection with Shostakovich. It sounds brilliant, bright, and full of energy and happiness. But um, there's a sort of austerity, uh, austereness that, that um, is not natural. There's something that's not natural about it. And it's quite hard to pinpoint. It's almost like the Shostakovich being forced to sound happy when it's clearly not a happy world. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll uh, leave it there with Tchaikovsky. And uh, gosh, we're so looking forward to hearing this. I mean, again, one of the great symphonies of the 19th century, one of the great symphonies of all time. And uh, I think beautifully placed at the opening of this season, it begins with a lot of questioning and all the way through there's drama and questioning and leaves us with questions. And that is maybe where we are as a society right now. So I think this was a brilliant decision for this opening concert. <laughs> Thank you. Well, listen, I'm, I'm delighted now to welcome to our mixer, the one and only Patrice Russian. Welcome Patrice, it is absolutely delightful to see you here. <clears throat> Hi Patrice. Hey, great to see you as well. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm in my office, you can see. And Patrice, it looks like you're in your uh, workplace as well. I am. I'm in. This is, this is, this is like my office, you know, okay. <laughs> studio with all of the things that I need to stay out of trouble. All right. Very good. <laughs> well, um, I, I, let, let me begin by asking um, Sarah to tell us a little bit about um, how she and Patrice got together and a little bit about the choice of this piece as the opening of this first concert of our season. Well, you know, it, it was just such a, a thrill to, to discover uh, for me, I'm not talking about the world discovering because the world discovered Patrice long, long time ago, but for me, this was a, a wonderful discovery. I, I, I heard about Patrice's name a lot, over the last few years, and you know, just started. To, you get so many, so many composers you have to listen to as as a conductor. But when I listened to this symphonia that she had written, I was just so excited because I felt like this is somebody who is just so determined and so ready to express and just bursting with something 
And um, I, I thought, you know, could would she possibly consider separating just this first moment? I mean, the whole symphony is fantastic, but with what we had already planned to do on the program, um, could we perhaps do just the first movement? And I was just thrilled when her manager said she she has agreed for this. And then we had to discuss. We we got on the phone and, and talk started talking about the work. Yeah. So where where does the name come from? Color Express. I, actually, it comes from Sarah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because she said, well, you know, I mean, we could just say, you know, the first movement of, but she said, since it's going to stand alone as a part of, uh, it's going to stand alone in the concert and it's going to be a part of this first concert, we should try to give it a little, little more vibe. I said, okay, vibe on. <laughs> so she came up with a great she name, said, Yeah, she said, what do you want to call it? Well, what do you think? Yeah. I said, well, tell me about the piece, and, and and then you'll you'll know why I suggested this this title. Um, and actually, it was the only one thing that came to my mind. I mean, it was literally on the spot. And yeah. it's it's nice that you you seem to think it it fitting. But the story that you told is what I felt warranted this title. So tell tell us the story. Yeah. Well, sure. I I had been by the time Symphonia was written in 1999. And I had been uh, doing some work in film and television. Um, I wanted to be a, a, a film composer, and and, and that and and one of the reasons why is because of the vocabulary that that composers, particularly for film, use draws on everything. It draws on classical literature. It draws on jazz. It draws on popular music. It draws on everything that had become a part of the the the, the gumbo of my of my training, all of these different things. So I, that's why I wanted to do it. But every time that I would get a show or every time uh, I would be assigned a show, they would take away part of the orchestra for budgetary reasons, typically. Uh, okay, well, we're not using woodwinds on this one. Okay, well, on this one, we're not gonna do strings, okay. So that was okay, you know, for quite a while. And then at some point I was like, you know, if I had the full palette, what would I do? I became a little bit, a little frustrated and fearful at the same time, well, what would I do? So I just said, well, you know, no, no one is stopping me from being able to write something. Let me just write something. The idea was just to use the colors of the orchestra to just be able to expound upon that. I wasn't trying to recreate the wheel or do something that was so, you know, uh, innovative or anything like that. I just wanted all the colors in my coloring box to be able to play with. And uh, so that was the impetus for for Symphonia. And I wrote the first movement, finished it, had my cathartic moment, was boxing it up and putting it away. And then another composer of mine, a friend friend of mine said, you know, no, no, you should have, uh, have it read. And if you have it read and get to hear it back, you'll probably want to finish it. And he was right. And I was I had the good fortune to have it uh, read in one of the reading contests that the American Composers Forum put together. And uh, after that, I, I, I finished the piece. So that's where the idea came from, just utilizing the beautiful mm -hmm. colors of what the orchestra has to offer and uh, and uh, putting it to use. Well, that's exciting that Symphony Tacoma and, and our conductor had something to do with um, uh, this piece becoming perhaps a concert opener that, that could be done many places, many times. So congratulations, Sarah, on locating it and um, I guess having a hand in titling it. <laughs> so Patrice, let's back up now and talk about you and everything you've done prior to this, because you've had one of the most astonishing careers I think I've read about in a long time. You, you, you started out as a kind of a child prodigy, uh, well, classical trained pianist in the LA area. Then you turned into a jazz pianist and got picked up and your band played at the Monterey Jazz Festival when you were hardly old enough to play the keyboard, it seems. And then you, you had a series of jazz albums playing with the greats in the 70s and early 80s. And then you reinvented yourself as a singer, songwriter, R&B, pop singer, star. Uh, suddenly you're all over MTV. People are covering your songs. Your songs are getting used in movie franchises. Somehow or other, you end up writing music for films. You become a producer for television shows. And uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And oh, by the way, you've been a professor at the Berkeley College of Music, and now you're the head of the 
um, USC popular music program. So <laughs> that is quite a resume. <laughs> and I guess what I'm what I'm curious to know, first of all, the audience should all just go to YouTube and find lots of videos of Patrice Russian playing jazz, as well as being the star of music R&B music videos. Um, but let's talk uh, for these purposes here about how all of that somehow um, took you to the place where you decided you wanted to write kind of an unlimited piece for symphony orchestra. So tell us a little bit about your, your evolution. How do you think about all those things that you've done? How do they all kind of come together in you as a composer for a classical orchestra piece? I know it sounds like it's all over the place, but for me, uh, music is one language with many dialects. So the idea is that all of these different activities and wonderful, uh, fortunate uh, um, situations that I have found myself in musically all have taught me the same, the same thing. They taught me the same thing that my first piano teacher taught me. And that is that music is a, communica a communicative art. It's one in which if you are fortunate to have uh, situations that allow for you to be able to offer a certain kind of eloquence uh, in the way that you describe it, it, pro it possibly gives you access to that many more people. So I guess I'm a little bit of an overachiever in that way. In that way, I really took that to heart and wanted, because I love so many different kinds of music um, and styles of music, I wanted the opportunity to be able to um, understand how those different musical forms actually connected with people and, and the why behind it. I'm still working on that. I'm still trying to understand exactly the why. But in the meantime, the experimentation with a lot of these different other forms and the idea of of using the 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 communication aspect of it as the means by which because all the notes look the same. It doesn't matter what 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 uh, what kind of music you you're playing. You know, G is G, and a quarter note looks like a quarter note and everything. However, what becomes what comes before it and what comes after it and the style in which the music is played and how long that quarter note lasts or all of these kinds of things are these nuances that factor into the different styles and the different um, aspects that give the, 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 the dialect to this language of, of music. So kind of being into wanting to know why music reaches me and why music reaches other people was what this was all about. And this, these wonderful, fortunate, exercises and being able to do to do that have taken me through all of these different styles yeah. to answer your question how does it inform the music that i've that i'm doing uh, or continue to do for the orchestra or for the concert stage um i think that that's the place where for whatever reason there has been this grand divide that has somehow the perception has separated the people from the service of what orchestras and our concert venues can also do in, in, in enabling that kind of communication uh, in, that, in that particular way. I don't necessarily know why. I don't need to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the why about that anymore. I just wanna do. So if, since I have the capacity and have certain, have, are developing certain kinds of relationships, that offer that platform as an additional means to do the thing that's important to me, which is to use music to reach people, to be able to sometimes offer just straight up enjoyment and fun, other times to be able to impart and provoke conversation about difficult subjects, sometimes to be able to um, uh, allow people to peer into areas and feel certain things that they perhaps hadn't thought about before, um, all the different kinds of things that music is, uh, can do for people. To be able to have access to this platform now is a, is, is, is a blessing and a, and a rarity and one which I do not take lightly and one which I want to be able to uh, participate in and uh, utilize these different experiences and dialects to be able to foster that much more understanding and that much more appreciation of the art of music. 
Well, this piece, and in fact, the entire Sinfonia is so delightful and so uh, it just makes you want to, I don't, it just makes me smile, I guess I should say. It's, it, it's got so much energy. It's exploring. I can hear, you know, all kinds of rhythms that I imagine you might have picked up along the way from this, that, or the other tradition or, or genre or, or project even. Um, but you just mentioned um, sometimes more serious pieces as well. Um, I, I, I know that you've written pieces that involve, for instance, quotations from Martin Luther King. And um, uh, tell, tell us just a little bit about some of those pieces that you've written that, that are kind of contributing to, to more serious uh, cultural conversations. Well, one of the things that was, again, as a result of finishing Symphonia and having it initially read by the Detroit Symphony uh, was that the uh, award, so to speak, or prize was to be offered a commission to write for the Detroit. And they were going to be on tour the year that I won the contest. They were going to be on tour, but they wanted me to do something for their youth orchestra, which was like 200 kids ranging from age 11 to about 18. And they, uh, you know, Detroit was a, was a real center during the, the civil rights movement. And I was a kid then. And so they said, we want you to write something. We don't want a soloist. We wanted to feature the orchestra. I was good with that. <laughs> and they said, uh, we want something uh, for this Martin Luther King event that we're going to have that we're not going to be able to play, but we want the 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 the, the, the uh, children's orchestra, the youth orchestra to play it. I said, okay, fine. So in the midst of trying to organize what I wanted to do, and we did a three movement piece, I realized, I said, wow, these kids, to these kids, you are talking about a figure that is supposed to obviously that they should revere and they know under, and they understand why, but it's not, they weren't there, they weren't born, they don't know, they don't have that connection. So this is where I started really understanding that the role of the composer, particularly the living composer, who is given an opportunity to, uh, the rare opportunity to address the people that are gonna play the music and to be able to speak to the impetus of the notes that are there, to speak to the idea and the intention of the composition could make a profound difference on people. This was my first experience with that. And in addressing these young people and letting them know about Martin Luther King and it, his effect and how the pieces that they were playing, the movements that they were playing were these pivotal moments as far as I, my observation was of this man's life and his importance and relevance to culture, not just, not just present day and not just past, but future. I saw the kids putting pictures of Martin Luther King on their on their stands when they would have a solo or something. They're uh, watching their eyes and memorize their their solo and watching their eyes look at that picture to evoke a certain kind of feeling and emotion about somebody who was an important figure that they that they knew, but they didn't have a they didn't have the why behind it. And to be able to explain it to them and how I felt made all of the messaging in the notes that they played much deeper and the experience was deeper for them and they read more about him to understand how to approach certain types of things this was when for me what you just talked about it collided for me that the that the relevance in what we do as composers the relevance in what we do as conductors in 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 people who are presenting music to people goes beyond just the particular piece it has the potential to reach people on a different level and i think that that's a should also be a part of our mission. Yeah. Nicely stated. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> totally. Um, Amazing. I, now I, you I, see why, I mean, when you listen to Patrice's music, you, you, even though maybe you've developed hugely since this initial symphonia, your philosophy and thought, but it's all there right at the beginning. Mm. And, you know, I just, in listening to music, I, I I thought there's an incredible person behind these notes and we're so thrilled to be able to present you and present your music and have the opportunity for folks to know such such an important thinker and creator and educator and somebody who can reach people in a different way. So it's, it's just so moving for me to, just to hear what you had to say because I totally 
um, I totally uh, identify with what you're talking about, the mission of music in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you're also, I think, a role model and you're also um, somebody who's in contact with other composers. Um, tell me a little bit about the Composers of Color Collective uh, and, and the work that they are trying to do. Well, the Composers of Color Collective has actually been in existence for, man, I think I've known about it for about 30 years, and I think it's been in existence longer than that, but not not as, not as in the way that it is now, where I think that the idea is to be able to offer that these uh, wonderful composers uh, know one another, have met one another. We always felt the importance of having a certain kind of community. And I think that, you know, for some people they say, well, you know, composers, aren't they kind of, they off on their own little thing and they always, you know, and maybe for some it is, it works like that. For for a lot of the people who are part of this organization, it didn't work that way for us because we needed each other to keep each other going, to keep each other realizing that at some point and someday, the work that we would leave would be of relevance somehow. And that was all we needed as long as we could keep each other going. So um, the I think the eldest composer uh, involved in it is maybe 90 and the youngest ones are, you know, uh, maybe around in their early 20s. And uh, we, everybody in between, we play works for each other. We inspire one another to keep to keep writing. And now with the uh, focus of people like Sarah, who is like, you know what? I'm not just going to talk about this. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to look and I'm going to seek uh, projects and people that may that that deserve to have you know access to these farms, but we don't know who they are. I'm going to do some work myself and try to find find them and see what's happening. And maybe there's something that we can do. Well, that's the kind of thinking. And those and this is a a place. There are many, but there are other places, you know, where where we where composers can be found who haven't had a chance to maybe expose their works. You know, we know about the William Grant stills and, and you know, the, there are people that have gotten a lot of things played and, and produced. But the idea is to perpetuate, perpetuate the that composition as an art, as a skill. Uh, uh, you know, that th this is something that exists for people who want to use this means of expression. And those who make a certain kind of point or a certain kind of dent deserve <laughs> To have an opportunity to uh, be seen and heard, just as the uh, you know composers, uh, the orchestras and 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 uh, and and all uh, not just orchestras but all ensembles that play publicly, a part of I think their duty is to expose um, the compositions that are out there. And you know, I think that it, it it fosters a lot more than just people being able to hear new works. I think it also fosters an understanding about where people are coming from and and dials people in a little bit to you know different kinds and. Uh, uh, different points of view. And we are living at a time where we have uh, students of composition who have been educated, you know, in our some of our greatest institutions who happen to be of color, but also have the language of their culture and can offer ways in which it doesn't have to look like this and this. It's one, it's one thing who can bridge that gap very, very easily and can go from thing to thing authentically and communicate in such a way that it offers exactly what we're looking for when we are introducing new music. And that is an offering that is beautifully stated and for people to be able to take away from it what they will. They don't even have to understand it or like it, but it is presented well and is presented with the intention of offering something for them to think about. So that's Part of the Composer of Color uh, uh, commission, uh, uh, organization is to offer l tons of additional ideas for conductors, artistic directors, librarians to have that much more of a tapestry of musical ideas to be able to present. That's so inspiring. It just makes me excited to hear you talk about it. And uh, I think we're on the verge of, of a real explosion of, of new voices, new works, new ideas coming to the concert stage. And uh, 
I mean, once again, as so many times in your career, you're you're at the forefront, and we're we're yes. just so delighted to to present um, your piece, uh, Color Express, on this first concert. And I'm sure we will be in touch with you again in the future. I hope so. I hope so. I'm looking forward to hearing all about what happens that in on this beautiful show. Um, you know. I'm in great company as far as these other composers are concerned. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Check out, you know, uh, it's it's crazy. At the, at what's really crazy for me, <laughs> and some of your viewers may appreciate this and some may not know, but at the same time that you guys are going to play this piece, I'm trending on TikTok. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, whoa, can we be any far apart and yet be doing the exact same thing? Communicating mm -hmm. music, so I'm, I'm really like this is a great week for me, and I thank you for the the, the the great blessing of getting to know you. I hope that we will be able to continue uh, the dialogue about being able to present pieces and um, you know do things specifically for you, Sarah, uh, in whether it be smaller work, chamber ensembles, the large orchestra, whatever. Greg, thank you so much for allowing me to be able to tell you my stories. And to all of my friends in uh, the Washington State area, um, thank you so much for supporting this orchestra and supporting what they're about because it's important to all of us. It, cult, this is our culture. This is what makes us human. Art makes us human. Amen to that. Uh, for our audience out there, if you haven't yet got either season tickets or individual tickets for this concert, just go to symphonytacoma.org and you can go slash concerts if you want to get more specific. Again, symphonytacoma.org slash concerts and uh, pick up tickets for this concert. Uh, of course, uh, consider picking up season tickets. This concert is only the first and there's all kinds of concerts coming up for the rest of our season. So thank you so much, Patrice, for joining us on this mixture. Um, once again, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us in this mixer. And um, I'm, I'm Greg Utes and uh, always happy to share some ideas with you and um, look forward to seeing you in the Pantages on the 23rd. Thanks so Thank much. You, Thank <laughs> you, Greg. Thank you. Another great composer there. <laughs> Thank you. We look forward to uh, seeing you all in person and dialing you in on the night if we can, Patrice. Thank you. Congratulations on TikTok. Ha <laughs> ha!